this is Ricardo Neri. Um, Hi. We're, we both work at Intel, and we're going to talk about um, uh, we're going well, we're going to talk about hybrid scheduling on Intel in general. Um, it's not uh, EAS specific, as the uh, program says, but but there is we can talk about EAS in there as well, and we'll we'll talk about why that's good and bad on this particular piece of hardware. Um, let's see. So. I'll start and I'll go through sort of hard, how the hardware works. So we all are on the same page there. And uh, Ricardo will talk more about the scheduling since he's the one cutting most of the code in this area and can do a better job than I. So this kind of diagram is um, meant to show what we call a, um, a two plus eight system. So there's two P cores and there's eight E cores, formerly known as atoms. Um, uh, important to realize that on this chip, this is a picture of an Alder Lake, uh, which is shipping today. And maybe there's some Alder Lake laptops. Raise your hand if you have an Alder Lake laptop. Nobody. <laughs> Go buy some. Um, there's SMT on the P cores, which is pretty important from a scheduling point of view. So uh, it's important to realize the bottom line is the same instructions run on all processors. So. Not every concept works that way, but that's how our products work and, and will work for the foreseeable future. Um, here we're depicting um, blue as a completely idle CPU and, and uh, the orange boxes are supposed to be work. Okay, and there's a run queue on one of them, the other one's uh, no run queue. So this is sort of the decoder for what comes next. So if you look back in um, 4.9, where before we enabled ITMT, which is for Intel Turbo Boost Max technology, also known as ITBM, two acronyms for the same phrase. Um, um, uh, Linux treated all the CPUs as the same on IA, and so it's sort of random how uh, work would be placed on different CPUs, though we did know about HT. You wouldn't, you'd use the atoms, I'm sorry, the E cores sometimes and the P cores other times. And so your vari variability in performance could be quite different. And I'm, I must highlight, um, yeah, the uh, instruction set's the same, but the performance can vary quite a lot. And we'll talk about more of that uh, in a second. Um, and so in 4.10, um, we enabled ITMT, which enables the ASIM packing in the scheduler. And so we would prefer the P cores over the E cores. Unfortunately, the way that code worked on this piece of hardware it also preferred the, preferred the P-Core siblings, which is generally a bad idea. You really want to use a dedicated E-Core rather than a busy HT sibling. So basically, we fixed the, and, and uh, that's how you disable it if, you, if you're burdened with a kernel of that age. Um, and we fixed that in uh, 5.16, so we have task placement E-Core, uh, P-Core E-Core, P-Core HT sibling. Uh, pretty straightforward, yep. Okay. And so the way this works is um, uh, HWP uh, in the hardware informs the Intel P-State driver, which hooks into the uh, ASIM packing uh, ITMT in the scheduler. And that, all it does is in the idle load balancer, um, doesn't touch anything else, doesn't touch the wake up path or the, or the periodic load balancer. Okay. Um, okay, so starts to get more interesting here. Remember, I said that the, P and the, the reason the boxes were bigger, the P cores are faster than the E cores. They're not just faster in that they can go at a higher frequency, they actually can get more work done per cycle. So this is um, an IPC ratio of 1.27. Um, I think I actually showed in the Yogini talk yesterday a picture of this being measured where you could see the, the, the IPC and then when the, um, when the two siblings are busy, the IPC of the P core actually drops below that of a dedicated E core. This is for a nominal instruction mix. What is that nominal instruction mix, right? Um, and uh, it, the answer is it's, it's integer code, but we'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, here, uh, uh, a new feature that comes along with this piece of hardware is called hardware feedback in interface. It's been documented for some time in the SDM. Um, and it gives a performance and efficiency score. We're focusing on performance for today. And what it does here is this 56, and it, oh, we'll first look at the, the uh, what's supposed to be green um, uh, part down there is uh, the, the E cores. That 3.0 stands for three gigahertz. So we sort of normalize to three gigahertz. So performance and frequency are the same. Um, and for the P cores, 
uh, we remember that 127 from the previous foil, we multiply that by the frequency and we get, you know, 56. So it's sort of like it were, it's sort of like it would be a 5.6 gigahertz um, E core is what the, P, what the P core is, right? Um, and so that's where the numbers in this table uh, come from. And what this table does, we already knew from HWP uh, interface for hardware P states, uh, these exact same performance numbers. But um, uh, the thing about this table is, it, at least the, in the architecture, it can change at runtime if conditions change. Uh, it also gives us efficiency score. Um, and that could also change at runtime. This table can be updated dynamically. Every CPU maps to a row, and as you can see, some of the rows are shared. Um, okay, so that 127, that 127 was an oversimplification. So enter a feature called, what's now called, uh, what do they call it? Intel Thread Director, ITD, yes, sorry, I should have put it on the slide. Intel Thread Director, uh, Adds, adds, adds the notion of, oh, not all ICEs are created equal. So sometimes you're, you know, if you're running SSC or, or say if you're doing system calls or kernel code, it's probably that 127 is actually right in the ballpark. But if you're running AVX code, uh, it's maybe 1.5 times faster. If you're running VNNI, it might be two times faster or more. Uh, if you're running a pause loop, who cares where you run? It's the same, right? Um, so uh, there's this concept of, these ISAs are examples. The classes are what the kernel looks at. It looks at the table. It doesn't actually say, oh, you are AVX. It just says, you're class one, and I know what to do with class one. I'm just labeling AVX so that you know what it means, but the kernel doesn't care. Um, and so what we do in ITD is we expose, instead of one 1 1.27x multiplier, we expose four classes, uh, performance uh, zero, one, two, and three. So say uh, that last one was the pause loop, and you can see that 4.4, hmm, that's 1.0 times 4.4 gigahertz, right? So that's the place where the performance was a wash, and you just see the frequency difference. And the other ones, you can see the 2.0, is, is, and this is, how a, um, this is how the kernel can know that if it's a really good idea, for example, to run VNNI on a P core versus an E core when there's a choice. Okay, because you can double the performance if you if you choose right. It's not just frequency. It's it's what you're running there, and that's a pretty cool feature. The way this is implemented is, um, the uh, at any given time you can read this uh, feedback register and it says what ISA has been what ISA class has been running recently, and then of course when we context switch, there's an H reset instruction that says oh forget all forget all what was running over there and start um, um, analyzing for the new task so that we can give tasks an identity, which we're putting in the class um, and remembering it for the next time we want to schedule that guy, where do we want to put him? And now let's see how that looks in the implementation in the scheduler. Uh, as Len was saying previously, what we do today is to use HWP to determine what are the maximum frequencies of each individual core on the system. And we feed that into the scheduler using, uh, using ITMT. And uh, that enables the async parking flag in the scheduling domains. Today it is done in the SMT domains and the MC domains. Uh, but that, and the new things are the red boxes. Oh. Intel Trade Director as Len described it. And uh, our proposal is to introduce the concept of classes of, ta of tasks in the scheduler. And that is implemented adding a new member to task struct, uh, which essentially is, is going to be populated by, in, in our case, with Intel Trade Director with the register that Len described, but it can be implemented in uh, architecture uh, agnostic way uh, whatever method architecture decides to implement that and then our idea for use uh, class of tasks in uh, in the scheduler is to use it in addition to whatever the schedule is doing today when decide when lo balancing load uh, to decide for instance in between two uh, otherwise identical scheduling groups or other or two identical wrong use 
and use the, the, the classes of tasks that are running in each of these round queues and break a tie between two identical choices that we will have when doing load balancing. What we see here is a, a depiction of, of ASIM parking load balancing, what that happens in, it only happens when, when in the idle load balancer. So with what's it, what we see here is the destination CPU is idle or it's going to be idle uh, soon. And it wants now to uh, pull a task from uh, lower priority CPUs. So if you see here, the P cores have higher priority and the, all of the E cores have the same priority. So today, either of these BC E cores are equally good choices, but then we can look at what is running uh, at these CPUs. We, we can observe here that we don't have a, nothing waiting to run on them. What all, that, all that we have is uh, the current task running on them. And then the, the load balancer in this case will check what is the current task on these run queues and uh, decide, okay, this is a class two task and the other one is a class one task. And then it will look, it will look for the, what we call the performance scores for classes. And it will see that class two has a high, it will run with a higher performance or a higher IPC if it, if it, was, if it was to be placed on the destination CPU. And then, uh, it will break this tie and pull the, the task two into the destination CPU. And this is the, the, the other case in which we have, a, we observe here that we have a, um, the two SMT siblings. One is, one is uh, only one SMT sibling VC, the other one is the two siblings are VC. And then the destination CPU here it is a lower priority CPU. Again, this happens in the idle load balancer. And we want to decide what would be the best uh, task that we could uh, pull onto, onto the destination CPU. And the intention here is to, uh, since these are lower priority CPUs, we want to leave the task that will run with the there is uh, actually a question from Giovanni uh, online. Uh, mm -hmm. read to you. Can you confirm the hardware Intel thread director is aware of tasks? Tasks, I'd expect that from the CPU point of view. The cycle is a cycle. How it get, How can it differentiate that? Uh, this is what, you know, what Len was describing a minute ago in which uh, the, the hardware has a uh, resources to monitor the instruction stream and it will see what the current task is doing and uh, it will write the classification on the on the class register and then when we are when the scheduler is doing the when the when the system is entering the timer timer tick it will read that register and write and associate it with the currently running task basically like this so the hardware is doing the work we just read the answer so in theory, you could do this in software, but we'd have to read a whole bunch of counters to analyze what's going on, and that's a there would be a, a heck of a tax in the kernel. So the hardware does that for us. This gives us the answer in this register. We read it and say, "Oh, great, it's class two. And then we, yeah, and we read it on user clock tick. That's when we we just record it. That's all we got to do. Yeah, when there is a user tick, it will. We are obviously running the current task, and we can associate it the answer with the, with that. So task. it's, it's sampled. Yeah, it's sampled that user tick. Uh, so I, I was saying, so the intention here is that we want to leave the bigger CPU with the higher priority CPU uh, to the task that will benefit the most. And in this case, we have two choices between two equally, uh, otherwise identical wrong queues, which is two on one. And we know from reading the the, inform, the performance information that the hardware provides to the scheduler, and we see that it will be better if we left class the tasks the tasks the task label as two here to the to the big CPU, and then the the CPU doing doing 
the, the destination CPU in that case would pull task number one onto itself. We should probably add that the patch series that Ricardo sent last week does this. Yes, we posted last does week these on two, Friday. Does these two cases. And so now we're going to talk about some cases that the patch series does not do. And we're interested to know if, if people think it's a good idea or a bad idea. I, I think I find a lot of similarities between this and like the uh, hints that people are talking about giving tasks, you know, that, that require low latency, for example. Mm -hmm. I know this is happening in the idle load balancer, but generally in the scheduler, right, if you want to um, give something low latency, you, you might want to give it like an idle CPU. In this case, you're getting the hint from the hardware. Um, but uh, yeah, the, what I've heard is people, you know, talking about giving this hint from user space as well. Uh, but yeah, so I, I was kind of thinking through these similarities and if there's any uh, opportunity to kind of have common code, but maybe get the hints from different places. Um, so two things. One, I, one is interesting. I hadn't thought of the possibility of the user space being able to ride that. I mean, for debugging, we can do that. But, um, uh, you know, we come at this from the hardware point of view, which is, hey, this is a great feature. Let's how to expose it. But, you know, maybe there's a possibility that the user might say, treat me this way. That's, you know, that's something we hadn't thought of. Yeah. Um, with respect to acting on it like you might act on a hint for latency, I think the problem would be that um, you, you may want to do different things. Um, like, uh, there's a couple of more scenarios than, than just this. Basically, what we've shown here is the ISA difference says when, basically, everybody wants to run on the P-Core. The question is, who's going to benefit the most running on the P-Core? That's what we're trying to discover and expose here. I don't know if we take the same actions as on a latency hint. I don't, I don't know. You could combine that hardware info with other info as well, I mean. Maybe. Yeah, that, that, that is a good point. Here, we are talking about a system that is uh, only VC in the sense that each CPU has one task to run. And the scenario you are describing, I think, is when you have a CPU sitting idle and you want to use them first, right, or prefer to place a task there. That was, that was my question. You're, you're always looking for an idle CPU? No, we have more cases. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because the point is that when it's idle, typically you want to look for a task to move. So you have only, you can probably take your own. No, hang, hang, hold that thought for a second. We have, we have the non-idle. Yeah, that, that was the next point. Then when when you're not idle, you have to compare the load. And in this case, how you will mix the load, CPU load, task load with this value, which is quite uh, orthogonal. Yeah, the next three slides touches That's the, touch on that. Yeah. It's a follow-up question to uh, Joel's point by Yusef. Along that line, can the code class can be detected by the compiler? Uh, it could, yes, uh, so, and that would be repeat, similar to- Can you repeat to, the question? I don't know if everybody heard it. Uh, if the, if the, class, the class of a task can be detected by the compiler and give it to- Yeah, the good kernel. question. Um, Good question. Of course, if it did, we wouldn't need this hardware feature, you know, if everybody did that. Yeah, but yeah, in theory, sure. Yeah. Yes, I guess that there would need, there would, there a need to implement the interfaces for the uh, user space that yeah, communicated. But, 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 but honestly, I have to say the hardware feature is better. Um, and the reason is because those classes I gave you are an example. And you could compile something and then run on a different chip, and the classes are totally different. For example, um, VN and I might be twice as fast on a P core on this chip, but it might be five times or half as fast on this chip. And um, or, or it, it may detect the classes completely differently. And it might be, I don't care about VN and I, now I care about something else because VN and I runs at the same speed as AVX too. Yeah, and also Mel Gorman uh, commented that the compiler could detect the certain instruction are used, but not the relative hotness at a point of time. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and the thing about that table, 
um, the register and the table I showed, that table is actually the definition of what comes out of the register. And you can't know that at compile time. You can only know that at runtime. And there is a, a shrieker. Uh, you raise the hand uh, remotely if you if you want. If you have a question, please uh, please ask. Yeah. Uh, so I had uh, two I questions. That it, also, it is also possible that during the lifetime of the task, it changes its behavior, right? And that will change the yeah. classification and the uh, yeah. It would need to be placed somewhere else. Good question. And. Yeah, the, 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 the last two slides, slides, slides uh, were showing what to do when a CPU is going to be idle. And we, are doing a, we were doing an idle balance or a newly idle balance. And now what we have here is what will happen if we had a, a few CPUs running busy and we will do the load balancing periodically. And in this case, what will need to happen again, we we compare the relative goodness of each task running on each of these CPUs, and we will see what combination will, will give us the highest throughput. Um, and there is precedent for this today when, when in the NUMA scheduler, um, uh, tasks can be swapped if they are found to be, if they are to be, if they are found in the wrong node, and the, the scheduler will. The scheduler, the scheduler will stop the two CPUs, swap the task, and continue continue the execution. We want to uh, reuse that code. Uh, as Len said, this is not we have not posted this code, but what, what what we want to use is to leverage that code, stop two CPUs, and swap the task so that with that combination uh, gives us the the maximized throughput. And again, in this case, we will need to do that because we don't have anything waiting to run. So we will have to swap the tasks that are currently running. So this is, uh, we were talking about stop machine earlier in the day. This is where we would use that here. Yep. Um, yeah, we had the remote. Uh, yeah, Shrikar, if you can try again uh, to speak. Yeah, uh, I had two questions. Uh, one is, um, is, do we have a numbering uh, thing for the P course and the E course? As in the E course would always follow the P course or can the P course be um, interleaved? The second question is, in a, uh, have you thought about the case where uh, the E course can also have uh, threads? Like, you know, uh, what if uh, the the capacity of uh, P core and E core could be different, but uh, both of them might have threads. Uh, do you, have you thought of those cases also? So let me start with the numbering one. So I think you mean like here is CPU zero. This one is, you mean like Linux CPU numbers? Is that what yes. you're referring to? Okay, right, yeah. Right. So uh, Linux gets assigned CPU numbers based on the order that CPUs appear in the APIC table. And um, that's a convention in the BIOS. And the convention on Alder Lake would be I think I showed it yesterday in the Yogini presentation. Today, it's CPU zero is a P core, CPU one is its sibling, uh, CPU two is a P core, sibling three, and so forth. And then when you get to three through, however many of e, all the E cores come come last, that's the current convention. But a BIOS could scramble that on you, so you can't you can't technically. My tools assume this convention because they've never seen anything else. But technically. It could get scrambled. Um, and I'm sorry. What was the second question? Uh, so, uh, in future, uh, can there be a e cores also having uh, SMT, but uh, the P core and the E core have uh, still uh, has some performance difference? Like, you know, right now uh, your e cores are not SMT, right? Right. We. Uh, I, I mean, I'm. I don't speak for the hardware guys, but I know of no proposal to add SMT to e cores. And in, in, in the security guys would cheer at me saying that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me catch up to where we were. I think we were on the live exchange. Yep. We're done I, with live exchange. Yeah, but can you can you go back one one okay. slide? And yeah, I forgot to mention here um, the reason why we want to uh, offload one of the threat tasks of the SMT. Uh, of one of the SMT siblings of a P core. And the reason is that uh, if you have two tasks running concurrently, 
uh, they will be sharing CPU resources. So even if you have a high performance tax, it will be uh, slowed down, quote unquote, by the other task which is with which which is sharing the 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 the, the, the whole core. And we showed a picture of this yesterday, um, where when we added uh, at the very end of the pyramid, we added the SMT siblings, and you could saw how the original guy got almost cut in half. Um, yeah, so I was saying that this is the case in which we have no wrong queues, uh, and the only thing that we can swap here is the uh, two tasks that are currently running, which uh, brings the need of having to stop the CPUs. Uh, and I should mention that this we ha we have this running. It's just not in the patch set. This work. <laughs> yep. And here are the things that uh, we are thinking on implementing. And uh, yeah, that we would like to know what you guys think of them. And these are the cases in which there is a there there is a, a, a tasks waiting to run that are runnable. And again. We want to use uh, classes of tasks to break ties in with uh, between otherwise identical run queues. The case that we have here is that we we are identif we have the the load balancer has identified that uh, there are two uh, run queues that has a identical load, and what we want to do is to maybe prefer the wrong queue that has the runnable tasks that have a higher that will have higher performance if placed on the on the on the bigger CPU. So in this case what we will do instead of pulling the task number one onto the destination CPU, we will pulling task number two. Uh, which is similar to what we saw in the previous slide, but in this case we will not be stopping the CPU. We will just pick it from the wrong queue. If you're going to move it to the SMT sibling, why don't you move the other task, task? One that may not benefit as much by running on the uh, Google core. Yeah, in this, uh, so if I understand the question, why will you want to increase the run queue of the, of the SMT no, no, sibling? No. What, what I'm saying is, I, instead of moving task number two, mm -hmm. which would have to share uh, the core, why yeah. not the other task? that's sitting on that run queue, and then that way to get the full benefit. I mean, you just pointed out that if two were to go onto that shared core, mm -hmm. its performance would be lower as compared to holding the entire e core. Uh, yes, that is true. If uh, so, in, but also in that case, one will have lower, lower performance. Yeah, it would be two and one will be sharing the CPU with whatever no, is running no, no, on no, the no, sibling. No. Sorry, sorry. Let, let me, let me uh, so let's, let's, why are we moving him at all? Is that uh, no, no. Why aren't we moving the other task on that equal? Right? That the two tasks oh, are causing the imbalance. It's just right? an example. Okay. Let, you mean we could have we could have moved uh, this guy instead of yes. that guy? Yes. Yeah, it doesn't matter. We can search through and see ones and twos and pick, pick and, the class. But you would want to pick the task that. Oh, would we pick from the front? I think today we pick from the back just in the. Yeah, uh, with our that's, just how, the, that's so how the load balancer works today. Right. Today it's just blind to class. What we would just say is. Right, we you, make you it not the fine. one that has the lowest class. Uh, or, or, I mean, essentially what I'm trying to say is the, the task that comes up with class uh, getting only 1x improvement as opposed to say 1.27 or 1.5 or, or 2. You would want that task to stay on the E core as opposed to it sharing uh, resources on the B core. Okay, so the, the concept of the load balancer is that Number two, no matter what his class is, getting a chance to run even on a, an HT sibling is better than waiting on the back of the queue for the E-core. Okay, so if you look at it as a time slices over time point of view, the whole concept of the load balancer independent of classes is that he'll get to run sooner, even if it's on a slower CPU, that's better than not running at all. So we're sort of basically tweaking that algorithm. We're not replacing that. That's, that's how it works today. Yeah, we are evening out the the load between all the wrong queues, and the question is, which wrong queue will benefit so the most? This is a crude picture, but but basically, we're basically if we did nothing today, the things labeled one or two would one of them would be chosen arbitrarily today. 
even if the CPUs were the same, different, doesn't make any difference. Uh, okay. Q2, all right. Oh, they can't hear you online without a mic. Here's one. Here. So, so what I'm trying to say is let's let's go back and say we, our original choice was between Q1 and Q2. Yeah. And we pick Q2 for whatever reason. Now, in Q2, shouldn't we be picking the task? That has the uh, inside Q2, not necessarily the back, but yes, 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 I agree. And I believe that's what we do. We will be picking the one that will benefit the most from running on the. So we could have gone another slide where one and two are in the same queue, and we would have chosen two because he's a uh, different because of this class. Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And how do so, you integrate that? Right now, in this case, we are comparing the load balance in order to, to share the time uh, fairly between all the tasks. So how do you use this new uh, input with the load to say, okay, if I move uh, the task- To break a tie. Yeah. Yeah, only well, when there's a tie. Okay, but um, I mean, how do you, how you, are you sure that you will not create an imbalance between all the tasks and the time sharing? The, the the time sharing fairness between CPUs is all already so horribly broken. How no. can we make it worse? No, you don't think it's broken? Not okay. Not that we'll much. need another session on that one. Yeah, it's all the all the purpose of the CFS and the load balance is to make a fair distribution of C, of the CPU time between all the tasks. Here, what you are seeing is that we don't care about time sharing. We want to use the Matrix. So, okay. I mean, you, you need to you take touched both. upon an, just... an important topic. Okay. So, so, so let's just say Ricardo and I are different tasks. Say he's a VNNI task and I'm an integer task. And um, we both get to run. If the CPUs are all the same, then it's all about did we both get a time quantum? Did we both get a fair yeah. share? But if we can double the aggregate throughput by having me run on this CPU and him run on that CPU, and we both get the same. Um, uh, time quantum, then that's good, right? But right. how do you ensure that you are not breaking that my point? Um, well, right now we're going to pull this task anyway. Yeah. So it w if, if, if we're, we can't break it, it would have had to have been broken already. Oh. No, we're only doing this if we were going to pull it anyway, okay? That's why the picture is drawn as it is. There's, there's an imbalance here already. The periodic load balancer is already balancing this queue for time sharing. No, no, that's the scenario I'm talking about. Okay, so you have an imbalance. Yeah. But, but in the case, typically, if you're there, and let's say that on your SMTC. You're saying if I pull an arbitrary guy out of the queue, then I could no, break, that, do that look wrong. At this use case, let's say that on the, on the SMT thread, the one that is alone, the load is three times higher than on the busy when you have the, your task number two. Normally, you should not pull. Otherwise, you are breaking the fairness of the scheduler. I think the key point here is that load balancing is not based on the number of tasks in the run queue. Yeah, it's, this is a, it, like it, I said, it's based on the load. This picture is supposed to show the load, but I didn't know how to show that with boxes. So no, this but, isn't but, the number of guys in the queue. This is supposed to, to but, take the but load. But how, how do you factor in your, uh, your fitness score or whatever with the load? Because you could be looking at a very small task that would actually fit better on one of the other CPUs, or it could be a very big task. True. That, that's, that I don't see being considered yeah, at all. If we, I, I mean, ignoring load and utilization is fine when you're talking about one task for each CPU or having gaps, I mean, idle CPUs in the system. But as soon as you have more than one task for each CPU, then you get into this mess that all tasks are not necessarily equal in terms of throughput. Right. Or compute demand. I mean, it's, it's your duty cycle task that you were talking about yesterday in your uh, Eugenie talk. Um, so, first of all, let's be clear, what I'm trying to show here is load, not that there's two tasks. It's just that that's, I don't know how to draw load. So, 
the intent of this diagram and the intent of the scenario is when we've got a tie in load and we're going to pull from somebody breaking the tie. Now, you're right. Once we say, gee, let's dive into that queue and pluck somebody out. Was it a big pass or a tall cat? Now maybe we're on thin ice. Yeah, you're right. We, we could screw things up that way. Yeah. And, yeah. and all the thing is how you integrate this new input with the load balance to make sure that, I mean, that's probably doable, but move you, this. Yeah, thing. sorry. I mean, the point is that how do you in, integrate this new input with the load balance to make sure that you will not break everything? It's, I'm not saying it's not doable. It's just that you can't just blindly take this new index and forgot everything else. Yeah, okay. And you have to find a way to- I think we're safe yeah. if, we, if we stick with a tie. I don't know how often a tie happens. Um, Glenn, is it, is it the case that you use the load itself? I mean, only in the case when you figured out which is the busiest queue, having done that to pick which task to move is where you look at this fitness score. Is that the case or yeah. do you want to find the yeah, fitness so, score so even the to break is, the tie? The question is basically, are you considering the load first and the busyness and all that to make the decision to move? And only when you have a tie, are you using the classification? That's yes, our that thought. Is, that's we, exactly okay. right. That's the original thought, yeah. So basically we would add a tiebreaker so we would be safe to not break what Vincent had pointed out. But if we, if we delve in and pluck a, a random guy out of the middle of the queue, yeah, we could throw, we could throw that off. You guys, we are taken. out of time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we, we have just a couple, I think one more scenario. And then we wanted to just mention EAS because it's in the title of the talk. And then there's this opportunity. Yeah, and this case is, uh, again, a case in which we have equal loads in, in the wrong queues. And again, we are not ignoring the, the existing load calculations. We are using ITD to all class of tasks to break ties between wrong queues and prefer one versus the another one. And here we could run into the same problem you just referred to, because if we pluck the wrong, if, two, if one and two are not the same um, size, yeah. So that's, that's good, thanks for pointing that out. And so we don't know how well this will read and then implemented this, we're like, hey, maybe this would be beneficial. I don't know, I don't know if this will be useful or extra complexity. Um, but we should talk about EAS, and uh, I think everybody in here probably knows how EAS works. Uh, capacity model tied by uh, tiebreakers um, with an energy model. And this is why we're not using it on Alder Lake. Uh, for the first, for the, first, the first deal killer is that we have SMT, um, and uh, you, can't, you can't reliably calculate capacity when many, many times per second, you're either you're off by 50% or 200%. Um, and even if we didn't have that on Intel chips, we've got a lot of opportunistic frequency range. So it's very difficult for us to track capacity when the capacity is opportunistic. Um, were those sol problems solved, then we've got challenges with the energy model. SMT impacts the energy model as well. Um, and um, back in the beginning of the presentation, when I showed you that table that said, this is the relative energy, uh, on this particular chip, that's a static energy model, which- Single point. Yeah, yeah it's a static, which under some conditions might be true, but under many conditions is actually the opposite of reality. So on, on these particular parts, um, the, the, the E-cores are actually pretty high performance and they, can be, they, and they can be driven to high frequencies and become relatively inefficient. Uh, they are indeed uh, more efficient than P-cores, from an energy point of view, but only when run at very low frequency. Uh, under many conditions, as you saw, the IPC advantage of running on a P-core is rather large, sometimes enormous, and race to idle with something that races there twice as fast, where you can turn off a relatively inexpensive uncore is actually a big win. So under many, many conditions, the P-cores are more efficient than running on the E-cores, which is counterintuitive. Um, so that's the challenge we have with the energy model. Um, on this particular chip. Right. We're done. Sorry, you guys. It's like five minutes. Oh, well, if there's, we're done. We have no more slides, but you know, if there's any discussion on, on, uh, we get asked all the time, why aren't you running EAS on this chip? And so we want to be clear on that. Right. I guess you all believe this. <laughs>